Coming up on Tech News Today, Verizon and Redbox joined at the kiosk. Is Amazon going to open brick-and-mortar retail stores, or will they use rebar? And Facebook, evil, lazy, or forgetful? All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, February 6, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle your used electronic gadgets from your home or office. Don't just sell it, gazelle it. Gazelle your used gadgets today at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we kick around the Tech News Today, try to make some sense of it all. Joining us today... Tech editor for The Daily, Mr. Peter Ha, back on the show. Peter, you feeling better? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry we uh, guys? Sorry we missed you uh, the other week, uh, but I'm glad we were able to reschedule and have you back on today. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry about that. Uh, no worries, man. Um, I, everybody was sick at that time. It was just yeah, an awful true. period. Put CES it behind us. Plague. Yeah, exactly. Thankfully, we'll never, ever be sick ever again. Ever again. That's right. No. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No one ever will be I sick I haven't again. been sick yet. Of the crew. Uh-oh. Knock on wood. Well, I don't have to knock. I'm just stating a fact. I haven't been sick yet. Mm, that's true. <laughs> I'd still knock on wood. All right. Uh, that's right. why we have these desks. That's exactly why. <laughs> that's for wood That's knocking. why they're made of wood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start off with uh, Verizon and Redbox teaming up. What's up with that, Aya? Here's what we got. Verizon was rumored to be doing some kind of uh, service with Redbox for a while, but they made it official today. They're starting a joint venture where Verizon will own 65% of this company. Redbox will have 35%. And here's the deal. You have a DVD service with the kiosks, and you still have Verizon's streaming service. So that's what this company is going to do. You're not going to see DVDs by mail, although this, uh, this joint venture isn't going to be live until, I think, it's the second half of this year. So you don't know if things will change. They, they were pretty coy in their press release about what other services they'll be doing. On top of that, Coinstar, which owns Redbox, basically said their fourth quarter profit more than doubled. So they're making lots of money. They, uh, Redbox is buying uh, some assets from NCR which NCR powered uh, by Blockbuster Express kiosks. So Redbox is going to get a lot more kiosks, retailer contracts, so they're going to get some nice prime locations, DVD inventory, and the deal's worth about $100 bucks. Coinstar will uh, also buy hardware, software, and services from NCR, and that deal's another $25 million. So That's- if you were looking at this saying, oh, they're going to partner with Verizon and get out of the business of DVDs and get into streaming, not so. They wouldn't be spending $125 million on NCR. Well, that and Verizon's probably qu- quite happy with the idea that they're going to have a presence in a, a much larger experience than Redbox. Now Redbox will have more kiosks. Well, and as long as they keep getting deals where they can get movies 56 days ahead of Netflix, then people will continue to say, well, okay, it's physical media, but... It's still the movie I want to watch tonight. Well, and that, that's a good point. Coinstar has decided not to play ball with Time Warner, uh, or, or actually with Warner Brothers, over the 56-day delay that Netflix has agreed to for their mm-hmm. DVDs. Uh, but that means that Coinstar has to go and pay full price for any of the Warner Brothers DVDs that it would have gotten under the previous deal. So, that, And then that brings up the question, what, uh, how does that affect the Verizon... Coinstar partner streaming service. Well, you know, Verizon has good relationships with the studios, but will Warner Brothers say, I'm sorry, Verizon, you're partnered up with Coinstar. We're not going to play ball because they won't play ball with us on the DVDs. Peter, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I'm just curious to know whether or not this is going to apply for, like, say, Verizon Fios customers. And then, you know, they mentioned the mobile portion of it, but is that going to be limited to Verizon wireless customers? Or are they going to build an app that you can sort of stream things from? That's a really good question, yeah. uh, too, which is how, they, they didn't give any details on what form this service is going right. to take, which makes me think that they haven't worked out how they're going to roll it out uh, and whether you'll be, get, be able to get it if you're on Comcast or AT&T U-verse or something like that or, right. or, or, or if you'll pay less or it'll come bundled, et cetera. We have no pricing plans. We have very little on this. So, I mean, it's just like, okay, it's coming. It's going to be red. Verizon is this like a too. Quickster thing where they just announce it, but then it's not going to happen? I would. I would hope not. <laughs> I doubt it. I. I, I don't think. I yeah. don't think Verizon is. 
I, especially <laughs> given the lesson that has been learned from watching the whole Quixote thing. I, I don't think Verizon is, is going to do that. Uh, and it's a, it's a weird, it's a joint venture, too. So you, you know how Hulu always has fights with its joint owners over the proper way to run the business. I have a feeling that whatever this ends up being called might also have conflicting impulses from Redbox and Verizon and run into some of those same deals. But, I don't, yeah, I don't think they were going to fold it up before we get started. But you never know, do you? Well, like on the Verizon side of things, let's say mobile, whether it's smartphones or tablets, it's sort of just like, it's great that they're going to offer customers sort of that option, but at the same time, if you're going to keep jacking up the price for data plans, what's my incentive to actually use it? Right. And how, how, do I, how do I deal with the threatened bandwidth caps? Uh, yeah. That's what everybody brings up when they talk about these streaming services. I'm just thinking this is probably going to end up in that kind of, it's just going to be a bunch of commercials about this saying, oh, look, you can go to Redbox and you can, if they don't have the movie right then and there, you can say, oh, I'm going to stream it at home with my, my set-top box. It, they're probably not going to address this whole bandwidth cap issue for a long time because, I mean, Verizon's kind of out of the game when it came to doing Fios. So they're working with Comcast for uh, for the ISP. So I don't even know how that's going to work. They have a yeah, but they still have a nice, healthy footprint out there in the East Coast. I like the way you ordered that, too. It's like, if they don't have the movie I want at the kiosk, <laughs> then I'll go home and stream it on my set-top box. Some Why did I leave that. the house in the first place? Some people go up to the, like I've been to supermarkets where people go up to the kiosk and they're browsing there. I don't know why they want to stand in the exit, but they mm -hmm. just want to do that there. It, it's it's just I just think that it's it's hitting an area that Netflix doesn't have. They don't have a presence, a physical presence, like anywhere. Well, I guess there's also, I mean, the whole idea that sometimes bandwidth can make a movie look crappy. I mean, that happens to be with Netflix at certain times of the day. Sometimes, if you just don't want to have to deal with it, and you seem to have that same issue around prime time, then the physical DVD is the better way to go. Yeah, I do wonder if Verizon will be able to get away with giving you a break on bandwidth caps or even striking deals with their partners like Comcast <laughs> on uh, not having this service count against your bandwidth cap and we kick off a whole new net neutrality war. Well, right, a lot exactly. Of this, a lot of the stuff in Verizon is video on demand, right? So that's technically not through your ISP, it's through your cable service. So, I mean, if, if Verizon is sticking that way, it never mm -hmm. will count against your, your bandwidth cap, mm -hmm. assuming they're working... Yeah, but this is a streaming apps. service, so right. this is going to go over the internet. This is They're muddying the waters, finally. This is the, the so big step. I just have one last question. Do you think that they're going to offer uh, Netflix-like capability on your mobile devices? Am I going to have, like, a queue? Because that uh, looks yeah. sort of be... and, and if so, do I have to have a Verizon phone to manage it? Right. <laughs> you know? Or, or are they going to make an app that's available for... You know, obviously, if they make an app for iOS, it's going to be available for every iOS device. One would hope, although AT&T has made apps that are only available on the AT&T iPhone. They're not any apps anybody else would want. Verizon has Usually a lot more maps. explaining to do, obviously. Yeah, yeah obviously. <laughs> well, let's, let's, then let's go from very few facts to absolutely no facts. Uh, <laughs> sources tell Good E-Reader that Amazon plans to roll out a retail store in Seattle within the next few months. I've, I've been betting on this for a while. A boutique shop. So it wouldn't be a big superstore or anything. It wouldn't be a big Amazon Walmart competitor. It would be more of an Apple store type of deal where they would focus exclusively on high-end items – like e-readers and accessories and Amazon published books. So the Amazon, if you don't know, has their own imprimatur, their own publishing company where they, they sign authors and put them out. That's a source of controversy with Barnes & Noble and Books A Million and a few other book retailers who refuse to stock those books in their stores, although they do make them available online. Uh, so you'd be able to go look at the Amazon published authors, buy some e-readers, Basically a showroom for the Kindle, and uh, they're saying that they'll probably launch this in the next couple months. It's funny that this is almost like the way that Amazon started online in a brick-and-mortar situation. Oh, with just books? Yeah, it's, it's like, well, we're not going to sell everything. We're just going to focus on books, uh, ways to read books, accessories for your books. Um, yeah, obviously, Amazon could not possibly open... Well, they could open a brick-and-mortar store that at least somewhat accurately reflected everything that's available at Amazon, but that's not really practical. So it makes sense that they're focusing on something that um, has been a really good business for them thus far. Yeah, starting small, I mean, if, if they if they try to stock everything that they sell, it'd be <laughs> like basically giant super Walmarts just landing in different areas. Yeah. That seems like that'd be a real, real uh, hard task to even convince 
anybody on the board would imagine Amazon going, no, we're not going to do that. Well, and that's thing. kind of the anti-Amazon because Amazon was successful because it gives you more you than you could anywhere. ever find in a store. Yeah. So. I'm thinking with a small well, size. I sort of imagine, uh, sorry, I just imagine an Amazon store looking like Costco. Where they have everything. Yeah, I think that's what, when people have thought Amazon retail in the past, that's what they thought is, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be a Costco. It's going to be a Sam's. It's going to be this vast acreage of everything. You know, it's going to be a working warehouse. Uh, but I, I do think this is smarter, which is, you know, come up with a, a mall type showroom that says, hey, the, if, if you want to get your hands on a Kindle, yeah, you can go to a Target or something like that. But here's a, here's an experience that we control. We can we can instruct you, show you how it works. You can browse on a free Wi-Fi and download some books if you have a Kindle, et cetera, et cetera. And retail seems like it's a tricky thing for online in general. Like, I mean, when Apple or tech companies, Apple did their retail stores, people thought they were crazy. Gateway had their stores and those kind of flopped. And then Microsoft has its own set of stores. Microsoft sells software, so it's kind of a bizarre kind of experience. So you can and get signature PCs. Oh, that's, that's that right. No I forgot about that. But the thing is, Amazon does have a product to sell you. And they, they can get this in your hands and have a different kind of feel when it comes to knowledgeable people. I know that you can get Kindles and Targets and Best Buys. You can get them everywhere. But to control the message the way Apple does is something I'm pretty sure Amazon is you know, pretty sensitive about. If they can get people to go, yeah, this is the Kindle. It's, it's 80 bucks. Oh, by the way, that case there is only 70 bucks. You can get that too. I mean, it seems like they can move a lot more merchandise that they would normally have in the recommended items a lot easier in a retail environment. Yeah, I mean, so much of what Amazon sells, like, you don't have to tell me that I need paper towels. I already know. And I might get them through Amazon because it's cheaper if I've got Amazon Prime. But do I want a book that's exclusively available through Amazon by an author that I might not be that familiar with? That would be um, a place where one of these uh, retail stores would really come in handy where I could have somebody, oh, yeah, this author's really great, and and here's more uh, from our collection. Here's an e-reader you might really like, et cetera. And Amazon has been doing pioneering those lockers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe they have a little locker area so you can have stuff shipped to the Amazon store. Because you're going to be in the mall anyway, yeah. so you might as well just swing by. That's a good idea. Also, people in the chat room asking about taxes, right? That's been the big battle with Amazon is not paying taxes uh, in, in local markets, in states and cities, if they did a retail store, they would have to pay taxes on everything they do. But remember, there is a federal online tax initiative going through that Amazon backs. I'm guessing they bet that that goes through, their online service is covered by that law, and so then they're, they've got a blanket coverage for opening retail stores any way they want because they already have a tax agreement uh, with the with with essentially through a federal law with every state in the United States. And one that would be starting in Seattle is because Amazon is based in Seattle. They've done other test programs there too. They have to pay taxes to Washington. They are completely fine testing things in that town. I just, I'd like to say a couple things about this whole Amazon store. A, I don't know that I'd ever want to go into an actual Amazon store if they've already built the experience of buying a Kindle and sort of all these other items pretty, pretty well online. Uh, and don't you think they'd just be better served if they had those little cart kiosk things rather than a big whole store with just a couple Kindles and accessories? But where are you going to put the lockers? No, I I, I, I thought of that too, Peter. Yeah, you just leave the lockers where they are. <laughs> and and you go with the Dell and the, and the old uh, AT&T Verizon model of, of, you know, the cart, the Rosetta Stone model of the cart. But I think what right. Amazon is trying to do is look more high end, if, if this rumor is true. Uh, and those carts, they, they kind of do have the perception of being sort of, not fly by night, but lesser value items. But they've been selling millions upon millions of Kindles online for years. So I just, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me to open up a high-end store like an Apple or whatever the case is. Yeah, I, you know, I think they're looking at Barnes & Noble and Barnes & Noble is pushing their stores as showrooms now. And Amazon may be thinking, hey, we got to we got to get into that too. I don't know. It's, it's, it'll be interesting to see if this pans out. Internet giants pulling out content in India. Is this censorship? Google and Facebook have both removed content from some of their Indian websites following a court directive warning them that a crackdown, in the words of the court, like China, would take place if they did not take steps to protect religious sensibilities. They are among 21 companies ordered to figure out how to block images that are deemed offensive to Hindus, Muslims, and Christians. This is in the wake of an Indian law passed last year that makes companies responsible for what their users post on their websites and requires them to respond 
within 36 hours to complaints about offending content and remove them. And they have to take proactive measures as well. Uh, there's two court cases being brought over such images. Uh, Mufti Aji's Arshad Kazim runs a website called Fatwa Online that gives answers to moral questions. Uh, and there is another suit brought by journalist Vinay Ray uh, that is being appealed to the high court. Uh, and so Google announced today that they have removed content and disabled content from local domains, YouTube and Blogger. Uh, Google spokeswoman Paroma Roy Chowdhury told Reuters that Facebook has also uh, confirmed that they removed content but did not comment about why. The New Delhi lower court, that's the uh, the one that the uh, the scholar is involved in the case, has told companies on Monday to put in writing the steps that they have taken to block offensive content and submit reports to the court within 15 days. Okay, well, it's saying that this is this is uh, images that might be deemed offensive to a, a variety of religious groups. Are these images something that you know? Is there like a wall post somewhere where you can say, "Is it one of these 50? Because I mean, anybody could be offensive by all sorts of things. Anybody and say could that claim to be offended. Fall, by, falls under yeah. some sort of a Christian sensibility or Hinduism, mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that you know. Uh, if I was a Hindu and I as was a Hindu, then we're both going to be offended by something unless it's like, no, this image just isn't allowed. Under I'm guessing the there's a legal test for that in India because this, must is, be. this sounds weird to us in the United States where we don't have these kind of laws. But even in Europe, there are laws, for instance, in Germany about you know posting about Nazi mm -hmm. uh, uh, memorabilia, <clears throat> regalia, commentary, etc. Right. France has similar laws. So I I'm guessing that there's something like that. I'm not familiar with them either. Hmm. I mean, it's 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 a kind of censorship, but it's not as bad as China, right, Peter? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit baffling. I mean, it's it's 2012, and they're just now saying that people are posting offensive things online. Welcome to the internet. Have they not been to 4chan? Well, ever? I think the thing is that the, the, it's the result of a new law that made the content. Yeah. Providers, not content, like the, the, the host liable now. Instead of it being like the United States, where it's I see. you're you're just you know you're just you're not responsible for what your users do. This law is really really kind of harsh on Google, Facebook, anybody who actually hosts anything. They are now liable for this. It's a it's a really bizarre kind of thing. All right, let's uh, I think take it's just a little too much. <laughs> yeah. Let's take a uh, quick break and uh, thank our sponsor, Gazelle. Uh, if you got some used gadgets lying around the house, this is the time to sell them, right? There's no major product announcements out there right now. So you want to sell your gadgets while they're at their highest value. So if you go to gazelle.com, for instance, I, I took my iPad 1, not the iPad 2, but my original iPad, 64 gig, uh, looked it up on Gazelle. I can sell it for 200 bucks today, so I'm going to. I'm going to get rid of that thing because I got an iPad 2. I don't need the iPad 1 laying around the house. Go to gazelle.com, type in the gadget that you have that you're kind of tired of, don't need anymore. They'll ask you a few questions about, you know, what capacity it is, uh, how, uh, what condition it's in, and uh, then give you a quote. They'll give you, uh, send you an email, you print out a FedEx slip or a USPS slip, you print that out, put it on the box, they'll even send you a box in some cases, uh, and you can take that to the post office, to the FedEx office, drop it off, send it in, they'll send you a check. They can send it to you by PayPal, they can send it to you by Amazon, uh, they can send it to a charity of your choice. If you're like, you know what, I don't even need the, uh, I don't even need the money. I, I want to donate it to charity. They, they're partners with all kinds of charities already. And if you choose an Amazon or Walmart gift card, you get a 5% bonus. Uh, it's the easiest way to get rid of your old gadgets and get cash quick for the new gadgets that you want to buy. Check them out, gazelle.com. And, uh, and, and when you're checking out, uh, by the way, they'll ask you, like, where'd you hear about us? Remember to choose Tech News Today. Say podcast, Tech News Today. Let them know that's where you heard about it. Uh, they, and, and, and they practice green practices with recycling. If it's something that they can't use, they'll still take it. And they'll recycle it for you. They recycle ink cartridges, for instance, if you, if you want a better way of disposing of ink cartridges. Check them out, gazelle.com. Uh, it's just like when you drive a car off the lot. Your gadgets lose their values over time. So go to gazelle.com now and get the best offer before all the new stuff comes out. Gazelle.com. Don't just sell it. Gazelle it. Facebook uh, has been under the gun of Ars Technica for a couple of years now over deletion of images. And they still haven't fixed it. No. Back in 2009, Ars Technica figured out, okay, well, if you go ahead and delete a photo from Facebook, which is a pretty straightforward process, 
it 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 goes away from any sort of user interface that you would access normally. But if you have the permalink, the the, the original URL to the JPEG image. That link still works. The picture is still alive on a Facebook server somewhere. So ours had written a story about it, and at the time, Facebook said we're working with our CDN, that's a content delivery network, to figure out how to reduce the amount of time that backup copies persist. Well, about a year later, and some change, ours uh, looked into the matter and. None of those links had been fixed. They were all still pulling up these images. Now, of course, there could be a variety of reasons why you would take down an image, but sometimes it's because <coughs> it's offensive or or it's it's you know going to keep you from getting another job. They're, Drunk they're, posting that sort of thing. Something that you really regret or you really wish your friend hadn't put it up, and you ask them to take it down. So this is something that that matters to a lot of people. Um, at the time, Facebook apparently. Um, they said that they were still working on it, but in ours's article, there were some images that they said, for example, these images are live. Facebook ended up taking those down, but there were so many other. They just um, they just spiked the results essentially. They're like, yeah. oh, the, story, the the images linked from that story. Yeah, take those down. Yeah, they they basically they made the story deleted. look invalid. Yeah. but there were so many other examples of people whose pictures were technically still alive that it, clearly the problem hadn't been taken care of. Well, now it's 2012. We are three years after Facebook said, yeah, 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 we're working on this. We're going to clean it up. Uh, Facebook spokesperson Frederick Wallens has has issued a statement to ours and said, listen, the systems that we used for photo storage a few years ago didn't always delete image uh, images from content delivery networks in a reasonable amount of time. They were always removed from the site. But yeah, we basically had an improperly working legacy system. We're going to have a new system running within two months from now or less, and it will fully delete Facebook photos within 45 days of removal. Well, that all sounds fine and good, but they also kind of said this three years ago. Yeah, yeah, we're working on something. We know that this is an issue. Three years of pictures that could potentially be, you know, embarrassing or inappropriate or just plain uh, unwanted being uh, live and linkable after you thought that you deleted them is a bit of a deal breaker for a lot of folks. And The Verge notes that in Facebook's terms of service, it says typically, ta typically takes about one month to delete an account and some information may remain in backup copies and logs for up to 90 days. So that's something that Facebook wants you to know about. Well, three years is a lot longer than 90 days. So let's say we're giving Facebook the benefit of the doubt. This shouldn't be an issue more than another couple months from now, but it's kind of amazing that it's been an issue this long. Yeah, especially if it's for three years mm -hmm. they haven't been able to figure out how to get some photos off their cdn i understand how caching issues work and how certain things that you thought you've deleted have come back i've run into that before sure. on websites that i've worked at where stories that i changed or deleted suddenly have the thing that i got rid of show back up for one reason or another that kind of stuff can happen but not for three years it seems like it's yeah. just probably was really low on their priority list. It's like, okay, well, th here's the thing. It's very hard to find these images. I went into Facebook. I wanted to see an image. I'm looking at the URL. You can't just guess these URLs, by the way. It's not like, you, it's, not like it's slash I as Actar, slash trip to Hawaii. It's not like that. So it's, it's these ri ridiculous strings. Now, maybe somebody can go out there and try to attempt, like a brute force, and attempt to find every image that's back there. But... Facebook for the past three years has been doing what? They've been gearing up advertising. They've been making tons of money. And they were gearing up for the IPO that they announced last week. So I'm just thinking this probably just got swept under the rug after a while. And it's just flat out one of those, oh, crud, we forgot. We absolutely forgot kind of moments. Although I'm sure there's the very possible thing that they were just being evil or they were just being lazy. But I just think this, there's a good chance this thing was just so low that it just didn't happen. Yeah, at this point, ours, their latest article is like, hey, they're probably... They're probably telling us the truth. But in the meantime, if you do have a horror story about this, let us know. Because this is not, it's not as if a couple of reporters at a tech website are just trying to, you know, fuel the fire with Facebook. This is an issue that does affect a lot of people. So it is important to re realize that uh, pictures that you put on Facebook and many other social networks as well, sometimes these sorts of things happen. So I guess moral of the story is be really careful about your photos. But with, with something like Facebook where you can be tagged in something and then you can um, you can uh, you, you can ask nicely um, or not so nicely for the photo to uh, be eliminated. Sometimes it's not. Hey, Peter, do you have a, do you, can you think of any excuse for why Facebook would be letting this last for three years 
I can't come up with a reason why it's taking them three years, but I can tell you that uh, they're probably catalog- cataloging everyone's face. They have that, you know, facial recognition technology now. And I mean, to everyone's point, for three years to take some photos off the website, I think it's a little bit much. Uh, you know, it's just a, it's another reason as to why Facebook doesn't actually really care about your privacy. If they're going to keep those images for three years, 45 days, whatever it is, it's just sort of a red flag. It's another reason for me to want to just get off of Facebook altogether. No, I think I has nailed it. It's it's about priority for them. And, and priority for them is not getting rid of information. It's retaining information. And so I don't think it's that they're evil. I don't think it's that they don't care. It's that it's not one of the most important things in their day they they mark zuckerberg has said he believes sharing is good and the more you share the better and so getting rid of things is sort of against their their mission statement mm-hmm. uh and 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 it's it's not going to be a core competency for someone if they're, they're not going to get a good review for making sure that things were deleted and so there's probably a company culture of like oh yeah we need to get around to fixing that buggy server That doesn't get rid of the images, but yeah, don't worry about it. It's not going to affect that many people. Although there are concrete examples of where it has, somebody has got the direct URL. They didn't guess it. They saved it at the time and and they're still able to get to it. Right, Uh, but I mean... Go ahead, Peter. Just one thing. I mean, that I understand, but I don't think that someone works at Facebook to just go in and manually delete all those photos off the server. It should just be an automated system. So if you delete it, it should just be gone. Right. right. It's a, if, if it's flagged as not available. It can't be that hard. Then there should be a script that goes through and deletes everything that's not available. Yeah. But, I mean, you do want to make sure you don't accidentally delete stuff. I get that. But it shouldn't take three years. It shouldn't even really take 45 days. Google wants to solve all the world's problems, though. See, they're positive. Mm-hmm. They're helping the world at WeSolveForX.com. Uh, it's called Solve for X, a place where the curious can go to hear and discuss radical technology ideas. Think TED, TED conference type stuff, except done by Google and posted on WeSolveForX.com as well as YouTube.com uh, slash solve, we, uh, solve, we solve for X. I guess they couldn't get SolveForX.com. I don't know. Right. It's like, why uh, don't they just call it We Solve for X then? Yeah. One of Google's chief scientists, Richard Duvall. Uh, posted on his Google Plus page that Solve for X is a conference that has already discussed ways of transforming education, uh, 5X improvements in agriculture, synthetic biology, carbon negative biofuels. Uh, no problem too big. Right now, all they have is a teaser video, though. They haven't put up any of the conference talks yet, but they say they will. Sounds very uh, TED Talk to me. Yeah. Same idea. Big ideas, smart folks um, trying to make the future better. Weird. It's, it, it, on the Google Plus page where it was announced, one of these things, Solve for X YouTube channel should be up now, and it is, but it says all the presentations should be up today. And they're not there yet as of this recording. Day's uh, not over yet. I'm, yeah, I would like to see what, what, what kind of talent Google pulled in to talk about certain topics because, I mean, there's no, I mean, they can pretty much <laughs> pay for anybody to show up to ask, hey, what do you think about the education system? What do you think about uh, open source? What do you think about anything? So, I mean, this thing, they might have a lot more resources than Ted could. Although TED Talks are just, they're fantastic as well. It's very engineering mentality calling it Solve for X. Right. Uh, but, you know, the idea is taking an engineer's tactic against the biggest problems on the planet. Can't argue with that, can you, Peter? No, not at all. But I think, you know, obviously they're curbing off of TED and they're taking what's been successful for a number of years and trying to gear it towards sort of their, uh, uh, to solve their problems and their views and whatnot. But, My question is, are they going to, let's say someone comes up with something just so incredibly amazing that they're going to grant that person the money to go and do that? Because that's what would be interesting. Yeah. Because otherwise, it's it's the same thing as Ted. So why would I, why would I, why would I switch? Maybe that's the we part. We solve for X. So somebody (laughs) else solves for X and then Google's like, we will pay you. Yeah, we'll, no, we'll, we'll, we'll solve yeah. it. Now that you've told us how, we, got we will it. fix climate change. <laughs> that would, that's an interesting idea. I, don't, I mean, <laughs> it would be great to have some more details about it if they actually are giving out, like, grants of some kind. I mean, it wouldn't be beyond Google to do something like that, I would think. Yeah, I, I, no, that's a really good question, Peter. I mean, I'm not against more TED, more interesting topics, thought-provoking discussions. I think that's a good thing. So even if it is just that, I'm okay with it. But it would be cool if they went a little farther and said, you know, we're going to take action on these things. Usually the TED right. Talks are people who are already taking action in some way. So maybe it's like that too. Who knows? Uh, maybe this is a literal go- Google Labs. Oh, Google Labs for the world, for the universe. Yeah. Maybe. Why not? 
Apple uh, may be limiting Siri to iPhone 4S for a real reason, not just a marketing reason. Uh, Ars Technica has this story today as well. According to recent SEC filings from a technology startup called Audience, uh, Apple incorporated an improved version of its background noise filtering technology directly into the A5 processor. So the reason Audience had to put this in their SEC filing is they're going IPO and they have to show why their money from Apple has gone down. And the reason it's gone down is instead of selling chips to Apple, which they did up until the iPhone 4, uh, they are only licensing technology that is built into the A5 processor. What it does is uses the second mic on the phone, which the iPhone 4 and the iPhone 4S both have, to be able to recognize background noise even when you're holding the phone away from your face, the way you do with Siri. Uh, iPhone 4 does it right now when you're holding it near your head. But this new technology that's integrated into the A5 processor does it from distance as well. And that's why they may have decided not to include Siri on the iPhone 4 and remove the application is because it wouldn't perform as well as the Siri on the iPhone 4S. Now, remember, the 4S is still in beta. Uh, the Siri is. Yeah, the 4S Siri, uh, the Siri on 4S is still in beta. Well, that sounds, it sounds like... Uh, that's kind of Apple's message, right? Is that if they think something is awesome and people are going to take to it, Siri is definitely not perfect. It's certainly still in beta. But I would say that for the most part, uh, people were pretty excited about it, mostly positive about the implications. But, if, you know, if it wasn't picking up and the mic was twice as bad and, and it was like, yeah, the iPhone 4S version of Siri is great, but the iPhone 4 version of Siri is awful... That's very un-Apple. So I can see them saying, eh, well, screw it then. Now, the jailbroken iPhones seem to be able to make use of Siri okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not hearing people t complaining about how awful it is on, on the, the jailbroken iPhone 4s that have used it. But not, not that many people but are using the, it. That's a, that's a particular kind of person, right? They're going to go through the effort of jailbreaking their phone. They're going to <laughs> install this application. And if it doesn't work, they're going to write it off a lot more. Go, you know what? It was. It's not exactly the official thing. I think Sarah was right on point. I think Apple wants a consistent experience. And I think that this hardware uh, limitation is just one of lots of reasons why they didn't bother with having Siri on older devices. Because I'm just thinking, yeah, Siri ran on other phones, right? They ran on the 3G and and and, and above. But the use, the usage would be so much greater. Now, because it's an Apple product, and now that Apple has, has Siri, could their servers handle all that load constantly pinging back? And would Apple want the inconsistent user experience of, why doesn't this work when I'm on my iPad Wi-Fi? Why doesn't, oh, okay, wait, then maybe I always need to have a 3G connection. I think that they are so set on making sure that this always works, that they were just like, okay, look, the 4S is just the beginning. You're going to see it in iPad 3, I'd imagine. And you'll see it in, in the future iterations of Apple products. And, of course, they would like to sell 4Ss. That's a, I mean, why not have a hook? So I think there's just a lot of reasons, and this is just one of them. Peter, what do you think? Do you buy the idea that it's a uh, it's just a technology issue, and that's why they pulled it off the iPhone 4 and the 3G, 3GS? <laughs> well, I think with the with this filing, it sort of goes to show that, yes, it is a techno technological issue. Um, but at the same time, you know, like everyone else has said, Apple does want a consistent experience, and... It goes to show you that Siri is not perfect and that it is in beta because only 4S users have had it and a lot of people are complaining about it anyways. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, if you have iPhone 4 owners, iPad owners just flooding those servers, it's going to get even worse. It's going to get, yes, it's going to get even worse and worse and worse. So, but who's to say millions of people aren't going to buy the iPhone 5 or whatever the next version is called? Um and iPhone 4SS. 4SX. But, but yeah, it's... Sorry, my phone's going off. Um, I just don't think that Siri is going to be at a point when that new device comes out, whether it's the iPad uh, 3 that has Siri or the next iPhone, that it's actually going to be capable of working in a proper fashion, the way it should. It'll come out of beta in two versions. <laughs> we'll be fine. Let's move on to the news views. Screenshots from Microsoft's latest Windows 8 revision showed the disappearance of the start menu from the bottom left of the screen. But the Verge reports that's actually a hot corner in its place. Microsoft is also promoting the next version of Windows on Bing. There's a video of a beta fish swimming, and there are Windows 8 links that appear when you hover on, what do you know, hotspots. The consumer preview is expected to launch later this month. 
BTJunkie.org, that's a BitTorrent search engine, has shut itself down. Yeah, it went dark on Sunday. Going to the site now shows a note that says, in part, this is the end of the line, my friends. The decision does not come easy, but we've decided to voluntarily shut down. The site first went online in 2005. Looks like there is a chilling effect without yes. any need for a SOPA or a PIPA. That's true. GigaOM found an FCC application where Google asked the FCC for permission to test an entertainment device that has both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in four major cities in the next six months. So let's speculation begin. What's the device? Is it, new, is it a new Google TV? Is it Android at home? Is it a Google Nexus tablet? No idea. But Google's application says whatever the device is, it's already in the prototyping phase and it runs apps. It runs apps? So it could be a, toaster. a robot. It's a toaster. The Financial Times reports Facebook's mobile properties may get ads as soon as March. Currently, Facebook doesn't sell ads on its app or on its mobile sites. Uh, no word on the whether the ads will be on both the app and the mobile site or just one or the other. Uh, Facebook is not making any kind of official comment. CNN interviewed an 18-year-old Foxconn worker called Miss Chen about the working conditions in the Chengdu factory where she assembles iPads. The CNN reporter had an iPad, and Chen says it's the first time she's ever seen a finished one. Chen says that she was excited about the job at first and now says she can't bear it anymore. I almost feel like an animal. Chen also said that employees who speak to the press could be subject to criminal liability. Hey, Sarah, guess what? What? It's time for Patent Wars. feel better already. Yeah, but it's not the usual suspects. It's Honeywell. They're suing Nest over patents related to programming and operating a thermostat because, you know, Nest, that smart thermostat is out there now. Best Buy is also named in the suit as Honeywell wants to enjoin the retailer from selling the Nest in stores. A Simcoe analyst Horace Dediu says that Apple garnered 75% of all profits across the global phone market. Samsung managed to grab about 16%. Uh, so Apple's taking all the money. In other phone news, a new MPD survey says that the iPhone was the best-selling handset in the United States in Q4 of 2011. However, first-time smartphone users are still picking Android over iOS. First-timers picked up an Android phone 57% of the time, while 34% went with the iPhone. Join me, won't you, to the rumor mill. That's a fun trip. A nice move. I love it here. Electronic Times News says it has details on the upcoming Samsung Galaxy S3. The big news is that the device will be just 7 millimeters thick. The Galaxy S2 is 8.49 millimeters thick to compare the two. The sources also say that the ice cream sandwich powered Galaxy S3 will arrive in May and will be part of a larger Galaxy S3 line that will have variations like a different camera, one with a stylus and one with 3D. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sure Rim hopes this was a rumor, but this is actual. This is actually true. It's Apple a Insider, leak. oh, it's a leak. Yeah. Reports Halliburton. Leaky mill. Oh, <laughs> leaky mill. Apple Insider reports Halliburton will drop BlackBerry in favor of Apple's iOS for its workforce. An internal newsletter outlined the plan for the nearly seventy thousand employees who work for Halliburton in more than seventy countries. According to the report, Halliburton found after significant research that Apple's iOS offers greater security capabilities and control when considering future app development for the company. company. Ouch. Sorry, Rim. The thing of, you know, the whole security thing you got going, apparently not good you know, enough for just Halliburton. Stay, just stay the course. Don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. Just keep doing it. It's just marketing. Yeah, it's just Tom, marketing. But exactly. They just need to work on their marketing a little bit. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I watched the Super Bowl. I'm not afraid of trademark lawsuits. I watched the Super Bowl yesterday, not the big game. Okay. <laughs> did, you see, did you see how many advertisements and, and, and people are afraid of For getting sued? For advertisements, that's why, because if you use commercial purposes, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but I read a good article explaining that you can, as long as you're not trying to pretend you're part of the Super mm -hmm. Bowl or an official part of the Super Bowl, you can reference the fact that it exists. Oh, yeah. Yeah, anyway. Um, I think you just, that... Those three sentences now we're, were like sued. 13 lawsuits. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. So uh, when the big game was on last night, uh, there were basically three tech stories out. Everybody's covering it the day after, right? Uh, social networks. Did you did you Twitter? Did you use Facebook while you were watching the game? Uh, the ads, being able to go online and view them afterwards. And uh, the stream. The, the online streaming of the game was actually fairly successful, although they didn't show the ads in the stream. 
the same, at least not the same ads that you saw over the broadcast. Yeah, the ads would appear on like in a strip on the bottom that you could click after they ran on the air. And there were like three ads that ran in the stream over and over and over. Yeah, which drove people crazy apparently. But it was streamed for free, so I liked that. And I was able. It had the DVR functionality, so you could back up if you wanted to. So that was kind of neat. Like I was, I had the stream open while watching it on television, just because I wanted to not compare miss anything. the two. It yeah. was so far behind though that it was just like. Oh man, it's like it's literally three minutes behind at some at certain points, and that was just a little. The down. Super Bowl is in a very, I mean, it's a very unique position where people watch it for the ads. I mean, yes, many people watch the Super Bowl because they're interested in the football game. Well, the majority of people but, are still interested in the football game. It, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, or they want to watch both, or they just want to see the ads. So when you have the experience on streaming, yeah, you're getting the game for free, but. When it comes to the Super Bowl, that will tick people off if they don't get to see, you know, the the uh, the Samsung commercial that everybody's buzzing about, for example. Peter, what's your angle on the Super Bowl? Did you watch it? Did you, did you engage in any online <laughs> behaviors? <laughs> uh, I actually thought it was sort of a perfect storm. I did sort of put out a couple tweets about not the game, but the commercials itself. Um, but, you know, I thought that, yes, they were streaming it live. You knew everyone was going to talk about it on Twitter and Facebook like they've like everyone has done for every other major event. And the halftime show, there's sort of a lot of buzz about that, at least, you know, if you're into that sort of thing. But I enjoyed it. I thought Best Buy's commercial was really great, and so was Chrysler's. Yeah, Best Buy was the one uh, that, that showed all of the innovators. Is that, am I right? Kevin's system right. of yeah. Instagram. That was early on in the game, too. Yeah. I was at a, a party with, a, um, you know, a lot of people like the same sorts of things we did, and we all went, ah, it's too bad, it's great, square, square. <laughs> and if I just uh, may mention one more thing, a lot of folks thought I was in that Samsung commercial. Really? But are you you're saying right here now that that yeah. is, is not that you? you? In the pink that, yeah, that's not you? Oh, wait, no, that's, that's obviously Oh, not. that's you. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, someone thought I was somewhere towards the end when they're sort of singing and put the phones in front of their mouths. That was a horrible ad, and it was really long. Yeah. Yes. So it was. yeah, but it was not me in that ad. There was no Peter Haw in the Samsung. Don't game. blame Peter. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I tweeted a little during the halftime, but I definitely was watching Twitter all through the game, uh, and most of the comments were about the ads. What was really funny is I saw Danny Sullivan from Search Engine Land who said, "I'm actually traveling, can't watch the game, but I feel like I am because I'm just watching Twitter." And I know everything that's happening. Is anyone else impressed that Twitter didn't fail at all during oh, the game? I was point, watching, yeah. and I was watching everybody's commentary, and it was pretty funny to, to, to riff on things while it was going on. But never once did I run into a, a time where Twitter was down. And I was using the web thing. I wasn't using a Twitter app or anything using the API. I was using the actual web page. And so I was like, wow, I a couple of years ago, it would be a fail well, fail well, fail well. Mm -hmm. This year, completely up, doing a really good job. So hats off to Twitter. All right, that's the past. Let's look at the future in the calendar. Google started hanging internet cables today in Kansas City, Kansas, not to be mistaken for Kansas City, Missouri, oh, no. to provide the city with one gigabit per second internet. Congratulations, Kansas well, yeah. City, Kansas. Google's also expanding the service to the Missouri side of Kansas City. Same schedule, just behind a few months, so everybody's going to get nice, fast internet. Netflix's original series, Lily Hammer, is now available for streaming all eight episodes in bulk. Uh, it's worth mentioning that season one premiered on Norwegian channel NRK1. Uh, on the 25th of January, with a record audience of almost uh, 1 million viewers, which is one-fifth of Norway's entire population. Wow. So it's very successful, at least there. We'll see um, if it draws the same numbers in the U.S., um, in Latin America, and Canada. AT&T is now taking pre-orders for Samsung's Galaxy Note for $300 on contract. Start getting used to the word phablet. Ugh. 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 Gross. It was hard to even say it just now. Phablet. That's what we called it, phone blit. Ugh. The PlayStation <laughs> Network is losing its moniker. It's going to be rolled into the overall Sony Entertainment network on February 7th. Current account information and services aren't going to change. Nothing's really going to change. Although, sort of oddly, the PSP is still going to remain under the PlayStation Network moniker for network services. Okay. Uh, Samsung will release white and, uh, Galaxy Nexus phones in the UK on February 13th. And Nokia Lumia 800 say, me too, me too. They'll also be available in white, um, rolling out first in the UK, then Germany, then France, then Italy, then Spain, and a few more countries uh, with other countries to follow. 
And finally, Microsoft Flight is launching on February 29th, free to play, although additional content is available for a price uh, such as a Hawaiian adventure pack. Tom, you might be interested in this. Mahalo. Uh, for 1,600 Microsoft points, which equals to about $20, that adds things like additional planes and extra missions to the core package. Wow, lots of stuff on the calendar. Yeah, it's right. kind of a crazy week. Well, let's finish up quick with an incoming, incoming message. message. Thank you, yes. Uh, an email, actually, from Robert in Richmond, Virginia. Microsoft now offering a one-year Zoom music pass when you purchase a new Windows phone from a Microsoft store. Uh, he, he says, my guess is that they wouldn't do this if the service was going away, but I wouldn't be surprised if the service gets a name change around the time that Windows 8 is released, in which case you could at least report that the mm -hmm. Zoom name is dead. Don't worry, we're going to keep reporting Zoom is dead for years to come. That's this is based on a report from last week that uh, a Windows Phone 8 leak that showed that Zoom software on the desktop would no longer be necessary to sync up your Windows Phone with a Windows 8 device. So whether they're going to keep using the Zoom name, they call it Windows Media, or they call it Not Place for Sure or something different, it'll, it'll definitely be around the somewhere. The Zoom is dead story will never die. Don't worry. All right, uh, Jason, a uh, quick note on the uh, Roku app from Twit, because I know a lot of people are asking about that, the fact that it's going away from Mediafly, and what are the options, what's going to happen? Uh, well, basically, the Mediafly Roku app is still working. It'll continue working uh, until it gets replaced later this month. It should be kind of a seamless switch when that happens. So don't get rid of it. Don't stop using it. If things go right, it's going to be seamless. So hang tight, and everything should be okay. Don't forget to submit uh, stories for coverage at technewstoday.reddit.com. Com. That's our subreddit where folks can let us know what they want to hear us talk about. You can either submit a story yourself or probably the easier and some cases more important thing, vote things up or down as far as whether you want to hear them or not. Peter Hogg, great to have you back on the show. Uh, thanks again for joining us and let folks know what's going on at The Daily and where they can find you online. Oh. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Everyone can, uh, if you have an iPad, you can go to the App Store and download the iPad, or rather, you can download the Daily. And if you have a Verizon Android tablet of some sort with Honeycomb, you can download it there, too. Uh, otherwise, you can find me on Twitter.com slash the Peter Ha. Excellent. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is TNT at twit.tv. And you can give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. Our message, is, uh, message number is, I haven't done this in a week, 260-TNT-SHOW. <laughs> Derek Calanduno joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.